uh, I would like to start. Uh, so two speakers today, that's myself and uh, Francisca. Francesca will uh, introduce herself later when she does her part of the presentation. So the topic of talent and international mobility, I think I can easily say that this is a very hot topic today. And uh, actually, I'm very glad uh, that it is. Um, the way I would like to kick off uh, my presentation here is to say, well, let's look a bit at the history of international mobility. Let's teleport ourselves all the way back to the 60s and the 70s. And companies at that time, they were just about to start growing internationally. Travel was expensive, time consuming. Imagine no mobile phones, no internet. So keeping in touch with home mostly happened via good old snail mail. And there were very few expats and they were treated royally. Then came the 80s and 90s and international companies became global companies. Companies started up operations in Eastern Europe and more and more also in uh, Asia. Of course, travel was a lot easier and much more common. And then we arrive in the 2000s. Uh, where the internet brings the world on each of our doorsteps. And uh, many new hires in Europe have gone through an Erasmus program or its uh, predecessor of bilateral exchanges and want to pursue an international career. And this trend is continuing up to this day, I would say, where most uh, employees that are arriving at uh, global companies have already lived at least for a few months abroad. It goes without saying that these different phases uh, require different types of uh, global mobility solutions. And uh, so let's, um, let's have a look. So um, in the, um, sorry, in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, international mobility was for the happy few. I mentioned that already. And, you know, happy they were because they were showered with goodies like a mobility premium, cost of living allowance, housing allowance, and, and everything you could uh, imagine, all bells and whistles included. And they were typically the people who were starting up operations in a new country. And the mother company wanted to ensure that everything happened in line, of course, with what uh, HQ wanted. And, and global mobility was, in, in that sense, a bit for uh, people who wanted to make it up very quickly on the, the ladder, on the corporate ladder, or they were uh, adventure seekers uh, who were very happy to get out of the HQ. Then um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, many companies saw the need to uh, streamline their packages because they had so many expats and treating them royally was costing an arm and a leg. And that, that of course, could not continue. And that's also when the outsourcing trend began with parts or all of global mobility being outsourced to specialized companies. And also from the employee side, uh, th there was some problems because more and more dual careers were becoming the norm. And so employees were asking for, well, can I do a shorter uh, assignment uh, or can I do a commuter assignment? Then if we move to the uh, 2000s, yeah, that's where companies started to uh, tweak their packages, uh, which is really a euphemism for saying that uh, they were cost cutting uh, as much as they could. Because global mobility, well, let's face it, it is quite expensive, right, to, to send somebody on an expat assignment. So, um, especially because more and more people remember those Erasmus and, and other uh, exchange programs that, that are existing, the, those people were knocking at the manager's door and saying, well, when can I go on an international assignment? What about the, the future then, the 2020s and beyond? Well, if you ask me, that trend will continue. Uh, today's youngsters have very often tasted the pleasures of being exposed to international cultures and they it tastes for more companies on the other hand well of course they they are still under that cost squeeze and so uh, they are trying to be creative and tailoring as much as possible the packages to the, the needs of the different uh, employee populations that are sending abroad now i think um, it is fair to say that global mobility has always been a little bit of a, a reverse auction and that that is true today more than ever. And maybe you're wondering what, what is a reverse auction? Well, in a reverse auction, it's the lowest bidder who wins. And so when you apply that to global mobility, uh, you can say a company is always struggling to find the lowest possible, the cheapest possible package that will make an employee that they want to send abroad accept that uh, assignment. And so that's, that's what we, that kind of approach, that reverse auction mentality is what we are, we are seeing very much. Now, where is talent in all this uh, is your, your question. And of course, in line with what, uh, what the topic of today's webcast is. 
Well, when mobility was for the happy few, uh, companies were growing so fast and so easily, they, they couldn't keep up with finding the people to, to go abroad. And so um, returning wasn't a concern either because, well, when an employee came back, they, they could fill it with, with somebody else who, who left. And so it, it, there was an easy exchange of, of talent. However, as uh, more employees started uh, moving, the request came from management for different types of packages, usually based on length of assignment initially. Uh, but it's, it didn't stop there because cost was uh, really a uh, determining factor, uh, barely disguised under the veil of different needs uh, for different populations. And that's really, I think, where the link with talent management was born, albeit initially a bit tentatively. In fact, uh, many employees were sent on an international assignment with the intent of bringing them back to higher positions, back in the home country, where they could integrate back the learnings that they had uh, acquired in the, in the host country. But due to less than ideal assignment planning, many left upon their return because they felt the company was not really giving them anything in return. They were not recognizing their international expertise. And, and companies were also torn between, on the one hand, a multitude of requests for international assignments and the, the cost pressures of, of nimbler rivals on, on the other hand. So they start to think really carefully, but what, what is it really? What is the objective? What are the different objectives we have with different types of assignments? And so then it became really inevitable to involve the, the talent function. Uh, because you can imagine that things are a, a lot more simple and straightforward. If you just need an expert in some place, well, a, a person like that, you will give them the full treatment. But it's a lot less straightforward if you're trying to chart out a development path for your promising young talents where an international assignment is just one piece of that. Especially at a time then when those cost pressures are uh, heavier than ever. So only if you have a robust talent development system uh, in place, will you be able to keep on developing those talents once they return? Because uh, you want to make sure that they don't feel lost and that they don't feel like, well, why have I ever accepted this international assignment? And, and with the, the rise of, of dual careers also, uh, commuter assignments have become much more, uh, much more prevalent. Of course, it's not like the total real deal, but at least it gives people international exposure and, and it's a good uh, second best. Um, while it may seem evident that um, talent and global mobility have to work in tandem, as I just tried to demonstrate, to find solutions that both meet the talent and the global mobility imperatives, uh, in many companies, uh, unfortunately, this is an interaction that is only just starting. Uh, but it is also clear that those companies who do have already those close links between the two are reaping already the benefits of that in terms of retention, talent development, cost containment, and, and many more things. So where is all this going? Well, I think uh, a few general themes that we also see in the rest of HR is now uh, also having an impact, I think, on global mobility. Uh, three things I would see, employee experience, individualization, and technology, AI. Uh, let's start with um, employee experience. Well, of course, you want to make sure that that employee, which you're trying to develop, that that employee has a great international assignment and that it's a great employee experience for, for him or her and for their uh, potential, potentially for their family, if they have a family. And, and that will be crucial in retaining them after the assignment. Moving on to individualization, yes, that also plays a part. It, it's linked, of course, with employee experience, but in the, in the sense that that experience may well have to be different for each person. And that's where you as an employer and as a talent function will have to start thinking together with mobility, how can you do that? And finally, technology, which is a bit paradoxical in a way, uh, but, but paradoxically, it's also helping us both with employee experience, with the individualization, uh, technology can help that. How far this will go is, is anybody's guess, uh, but as we all know, the, the human is uh, more than ever back in uh, human resources. Now, in very practical terms, uh, how would you go about this? How do you bring talent and mobility together? Well, my simplest answer would be, well, have talent and mobility in your company ever even talk to each other? Uh, if they haven't, well, of course, start there. Because you might be surprised as to what comes out uh, and how they can cross-fertilize each other for respective solutions in their field. A second uh, 
answer I would give is, what about your employee value proposition? What is your employee value proposition as it comes to global mobility? What message are you sending the employee there? Is it like, oh, an international assignment is just normal, it is what we expect from you, and hence, make it work, develop yourself? Or is it an international assignment is really an exceptional thing, you should be honored to be given the chance to do that, or anything in between? And the answer will probably uh, require a few good internal discussions exactly between mobility and uh, talent there. This concludes the first part of our uh, webcast. I wish you all the best, of course, with that. Um, let's see if there are um, already any questions. Not yet. Please do not hesitate. Uh, but, uh, okay, um, since there are none at this point, um, Time to move to our next speaker, um, Francesca Hugenberger from BSF. Francesca, I'll uh, let you introduce yourself. Over to you now. Video for today, but still, I think we can make it. So my name is Francesca. Um, I'm leading the um, global mobility team in BSF. Um, and I've been doing this for two years, which is for mobility, I can tell you a very, very short time frame. And Wim said, um, you have to make talent and mobility talk to each other. What I'm telling you from the practical realm of BASF is actually decades of mobility and talking, uh, mobility and talent talking to each other. And also some topics, of course, or some things and some experiences that um, I didn't make myself personally, but uh, fortunately we learned and yeah, built up on um, because there is a lot of experience in my team, of course. Um, fortunately, this topic was very dear to my heart and this request to present here because I'm coming from a talent background. So before I joined Mobility, I did some recruitment some employer branding for BASF, a job which also brought me forth into an international assignment to Hong Kong, so I know at least what this looks like from the customer side as well, um, followed by two years of learning and development. Um, and now I finally made it into the, let's say, more fact-based and harder piece of uh, our yeah, of, of HR, as many people would say. So what I want to do is, on top of what Wim said, and I can relate to many of the things that you mentioned, share some tangible insights with you. I want to be quite open because this is how I am and this is also how I think we can learn. So I will tell you also some stuff that worked inside of BSF or still working and also some of the things that didn't work maybe or that didn't work from the beginning. Um, Okay, so I'm moving to a slide to give you a tiny overview of our mobility program so you get an idea of what we are doing here. Also being aware that some of you have a benefits background or even talent acquisition background, as I could see from the, from the list of participants who registered for this event. So I'm not going to talk about BASF because we are a quite active member in the conference board in case no, you don't know at all what we are doing. We are one of the biggest chemicals producers uh, in the market um, worldwide and you can Google us, we are also on Wikipedia. Um, so our assignment program at the moment encompasses about um, 1,100 assignees out of which 15% are senior executives and the rest are normal people um, either on middle management or individual contributor level. Um, with regards to our travel routes, you can see our top origins and top destinations here on this slide. In case you wonder what Ludwigshafen is, it's this rather small town um, close to Frankfurt in Germany. This is where our headquarters are, where 35,000 of our employees are working. So it's no surprise that this location is a main origin, also a main destination for my international assignees. Um, we are also very active in many countries in uh, Asia, as you can see, but also Antwerp, um, the US and uh, Brazil are big hubs for us. So this is the main route we are moving people within. However, it's a quite big and complex program. We are catering to anything between 60 and 75 countries at one time, usually. 20% um, of our assignees are women. 80% of our assignees are male. 
this is something that we definitely hope to change, actually. And I will talk about a few things that we are doing for that. BSF has just recently announced a uh, um, target to have 30% women in leadership positions by 2030. It's still a while to go, but you can also see or at least guess from the assignee numbers that we still have a little bit of a gap to fill here. Um, as you can see, most of our assignees, 57% are going abroad with their families. Um, and the rest of them, half and half, go either with a partner or even alone. And in terms of policies in use, many of you will probably be able to relate of, to the way how or to the range of options on how we send people abroad. So there is no one size fits all solution for all our assignees. But considering that the permanent transfers, these are our, what we call our one way moves, are actually dominated by uh, domestic assignments within Germany, where we have a lot of locations that we cover. Um, our standard um, thing to do is still a long-term policy, but we also have the yellow one, for example, our engineering project, a little bit of short-term, a little bit of local higher support that we do, and some programs for trainees or for intra-regional transfers and a little bit of one-way business, which we are hoping to improve. So this is just a tiny overview of yeah, what, what our program looks like at the moment. So looking at the title of this whole event, I was wondering, so is talent in BSF a match made in heaven for mobility? Yeah. And when you think about marriages, uh, you think back to the time you maybe chose your partner and latest when you get married, or in my case, when I moved in with my um, soon-to-be husband, you ask yourself some, some questions about basically the fact if you have the same objectives with that person in life and if the relationship can work long time, right? So with my partner, we were taking out if both want kids, what's the value of work, of family, of our individual passions in our life, and if this is somehow compatible with what we, what we want from life. So I asked myself, OK, what does talent management actually in a company want from life? And from what I learned in my time in recruitment and um, learning and development, it's really three things along the life cycle of an employee. First focus of talent management is actually to find talent and to create a certain brand within the talent market, also catering to more and more diverse talent groups. Yeah, so think of the mobile millennials, people who have gone on Erasmus, like Wim says, uh, who are global citizens, but at the same time have a very strong family focus. And as we learn, are less ready to make compromises on um, career choices for their partners, for example. Um, and have a higher focus on work-life balance as well as some other age groups. In general, not meaning to stereotype, of course. Uh, another target group is um, foreign talents. Yeah? Um, for example, BASF is very much trying to hire digital talents, so people who can program, who can run very fancy IT projects for us. And we are a chemicals producer, so we have a very good brand with scientists. We have an okay brand with engineers because we do a lot of our uh, production plant construction and planning ourselves. We have a so-and-so brand with um, business people, but um, IT people, they think of Facebook and all these cool companies. When they think about a place to work, they rarely think of BSF first, yeah? So these people, we can't just hire inside of a country. And we definitely are starting to hire also from foreign places. Um, looking back to this 30% goal that we just started, and many companies want to grow their female leadership pipeline, of course, you also have to look at the needs of your female talents, for example. And these are just some rather stereotypical target groups. And the other thing you also have to consider is, of course, as a big global company, the regional and cultural preferences down to the preferences of the individual people. So what I want to say with that is actually that talent management is very used to and very um, driven by the need of segmenting their audience yeah, and giving or making different offers to these different groups that work for them. And this is not something we are used to in mobility, in my opinion. So 
The next topic is, of course, the talent management wants to grow talent, um, for example, with continuous development and learning, ensuring long term employability inside of the company and long term value of, the end of uh, employees as well. And of course, also build a strong pipeline for succession plans and for your leadership um, suite or for your C suite. Even. And then the last point, very clear retention is a super important um, objective of talent management, which also goes along with career options, for example, when you return from it. So let's look at mobility in this marriage. What is mobility for? Uh, Francisco? Yeah? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. We have one question, and it's related to that retention of uh, talent. Um, so um, a person is asking, what can we do to retain assignees after repatriation when there are no senior positions for them to move into? Ah, I see this question now, Brunilda. Thank you for this one. Um, we can do a lot, but the most important thing is actually to manage expectations and to be transparent and honest to the people. This is our experience. Um, if you allow, I will come back a little bit later to what we are doing for the repatriation okay. piece and how worthwhile it has proven. Not of course, of course, no problem. That we have the super, super perfect solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so global mobility, having worked on this topic for two years, my super most and foremost and important goal is to deliver excellent services. Um, this is more important than any strategic topic, actually, because we are uprooting families and mobility. We are putting their life on their head and back on their feet. Yeah. Um, so to be able to support this with an excellent service delivery is actually, at the one hand, a minimum factor, but at the other hand, um, uh, is a very uh, big challenge. Yeah, every day for us, and we are really doing a lot to make this happen. Next thing in global mobility is, of course, the attractivity of packages. When you said that it's also a little bit of a race to the bottom to try to get people to move abroad uh, at the cheapest possible package, let's say. Um, on the other hand, um, of course, we always have special projects, special and very challenging locations. I talked about the 75 countries, so you can also imagine there's countries in there like Algeria, Iran, very remote places where we are investing in new facilities in China and in um, the north of India at the moment, for example, where we really also have a, an interest in making the package attractive enough to actually move the people, right? Because if the jobs are not filled, the whole company has a problem. Cost containment, we talked about this already in Wim's piece. Uh, and then this whole idea of efficiency and fairness, this was really a miracle to me when I joined mobility and even before when I was in this tiny myself. Yeah? Uh, on the one hand, you have talent management, totally comfortable and very keen on segmenting customer groups and giving them different experience and different fulfilling the different needs. On the other hand, mobility, most of our policies, at least for BSF, but that's also what I know from other companies, are very much one size fits all because this is this paradigm of fairness that has has been in our way of thinking and in our way of making policies actually for the people for a long time. It's of course a very philosophical question, what is fairness? Yeah, is fairness that if you don't get something, I also don't get it and then it's fair or is fairness rather that I get what I need, which seems to be the trend right now. However, there I really see a possible a uh, problem in that marriage, yeah, because the mindset is very, very different, at least in our community still. Um, then, of course, you have talent shortages on the one hand, like for these digital people that I mentioned, versus cost containment, and again, the need to provide a limited number of options to move people, but not to have some units um, pay more or offer more than others with the consequence that everybody will end up offering or paying, spending more. Yeah? And then also, I think in our talent development culture, it's very important to emphasize the topic of you drive your own development, personal invest for you to learn and to qualify yourself. Yeah. Versus in mobility, we are still coming from the point where we offer very fancy packages and then people move and this is this is kind of the deal that we have so the personal invest versus the corporate incentives we 
we use to steer people's behavior and decisions at the end of the day, this is also a huge difference. Yeah. Um, let me move to the next piece because I'm actually here to tell you a little bit of what we tried and what is working. So in BSF, um, we do different things and um, it doesn't it, it all start with the reintegration or the repatriation, but it actually starts with committing all involved parties to certain goals of an assignment um, within mobility. And as I said, this is not something I invented in my last two years. It's mostly things that have been around in one or the other way for a long time and proven helpful for us as a company to steal the topic. So first of all, and this has nothing to do with mobility, we have a quite robust system of talent pools on different levels in BASF. So there's, um, there's a very good understanding about senior executives and the candidate pipeline into that senior executive suite. There's leadership candidate pools below that level with the end goal of ending up in the middle management positions. And there's also in some communities um, in BASF talent pools for specialist careers, for example. And it's very important, in our opinion, or has proven very helpful to have these because then you can also Kate, adapt your mobility offer to the needs of those talent pools and what you want to do with those people at the end. Yeah? And depending on the level of talent pool you're in, we also have a quite solid offer of mobility education early on for these people. So for example, if I get nominated into um, a leadership candidate pool, I, I do early on get access to consulting and some, some information about what does mobility mean for BSF, what's the expectation towards me as a leadership candidate. And even with an increased focus on female leadership candidates, we also come to the dual career topic, which is um, a hot topic in the market at the moment. Um, some solutions and some extra support if I have a dual career setup, meaning if my partner also has a career inside of the company, they just can't leave because BSF sends me to Hong Kong, for example. Um, so um, making people aware of what they can expect and what the deal is basically has proven quite helpful. However, we also have to say this is not available for everybody. The more uh, advanced the pool membership, let's say, the, the nicer these offers get or the more encompassed. Yeah. Then another thing that we have introduced a long time ago is actually a kind of a business case when you send somebody on assignment. And this is valid for all our assignees, all 1,119 of them. Um, the unit that sends people out has to give a mandatory development plan for that person and a mandatory overview of possible, not promised, return positions. Nothing in this development plan and none of these positions are promised, but the mere fact that you can't get an assignment approved without putting something of this in writing and also communicating it with your assignee, um, in our opinion, makes a huge difference actually because it forces the units, the leaders, HR people, the talent managers to think about the purpose of the assignment and about the possible return um, when people come back. The repatriation starts before somebody leaves the country, in our opinion. Another thing that we do in this regard is to implement an anchor person. This is how we call it. I guess many of you have this kind of mentor, senior leadership um, uh, person in the home country who can act as a bridge to home and also help with job searches basically after you come back. And it's very important for us to keep this relationship going. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing, Wim, you also mentioned this a little bit. If we have special needs, we have also been uh, developing adaptive packages for special business needs, be it a leaner delegation package, be it a more um, yeah, finance heavy delegation package because you need better incentives. Um, whatever it is, we, we have been doing quite a bit of this over the years. Yeah? Still always struggling between fairness and one size fits all and business needs, actually. So I move a little bit quicker about the, over the support on assignment because I don't think it differentiates us so much from what most of you are doing. We are offering trainings, we are offering 
onboarding um, of delegates, or that's how we call them as Chinese in their new host countries and so on. One thing I want to comment on is um, based on our home net plus principle, which we don't have for talent uh, reasons, but actually, as you know, mostly for tax and cost reasons and also reintegration. Um, the salary is always continued and also the merit increases of our assignees are always handled in the home, which means that they are automatically part of some talent reviews and discussions in their home units, even while they are away on assignment. This helps. It's, we didn't do it because of the talent purpose, but it actually makes a difference keeping these people on the rider while they are aware. Of the uh, away of the HR business partners in the divisions of the management in that division. Because they have to communicate with these people, they have to take an active position about their merit increase every year. So it is a helpful piece of just keeping people visible. Yeah. And then reintegration, Brunhilda, this is also what you mentioned. Beside the stuff that actually happens before people come back, one thing that we have in the company is a so-called home principle. So very easy. It's like if you order something from Amazon and you don't like it, Amazon has to take it back. So um, not to say that nobody likes our assignees, but basically the unit that sends out an assignee also has responsibility for hiring them back into their organization if there's no other if there's no other options. So there's a clear owner of each talent on assignment and a clear understanding of who um, is responsible for their placement when they return or finish their assignment. This um, has proven very helpful over the years. Yeah? Uh, uh, Francisca, mm -hmm. there is a question here um, uh, about that anchor person. How do you maintain the relationship between an anchor person and an assignee? Is that a formal or informal channels or both? Both actually, and uh, this is one of the reasons why I put in my headline, it's improved over time. So none of these measures have been implemented and they just work like magic and have never changed. Yeah, anchor persons are a good, um, uh, a good example of that. So first we implemented the anchors and we were very proud. It was made a big difference and it made a lot of sense to have these people. But then we saw that some of them are not living their roles, some are more motivated, some are less from both sides, actually, anchor person is tiny. People would move jobs and it wouldn't make sense for them to be the anchor, but nobody noticed and nobody reassigned another anchor to that assignee. So actually, we started educating our anchor persons and the assignees about their roles. So some of our regional teams, they have briefing documents or even personal briefings for the anchor persons to understand what's expected of them. And now more and more with the help of um, technology, we are also aiming at giving them automated prompts at certain times in our annual like talent review cycle to talk to each other. Yeah. So, for example, when the talent reviews in fall came come up for us, um, um, we will send out messages very soon um, to these uh, to both pairs, actually reminding them that they are anchor and assignee, yeah? which for some of them is not so 100 percent here and prompt them to get in contact with, with each other. So this is what's happening formally. Informally, a lot, of, a lot of things are also happening between those people, also considering that most of the anchor persons are usually higher management of that person before they were sent out to their assignment. Yeah, So they know each other and they had some kind of working relationship in most of the cases. So it's both, but we are definitely always keen to find ideas how to get people more into contact and how to have especially the anchor person live their roles or pass their roles on to a suitable successor if they can't live their roles anymore because they changed their function, for example. Yeah. Uh, another thing, coming back to technology that we have just implemented, um, fortunately, we have an uh, assignment management um, software very, uh, since one year um, as an ending assignment tracker. So in the past, it used to be quite a black box for our divisions of who's out there and when will they return. Now, in this nice assignment management software, they can log in any time. And they see a list of people who was due to return in the next couple of months, and they regularly take those into their talent reviews, into their um, succession planning um, talks, and so on. So, yeah, this is also a point 
um, that we make. And one thing I want to just make sure um, is understood, accession planning, for example, there's always papers about talent and mobility and what mobility should get involved in. Many of these things on my slide are not owned by mobility. Many of these processes are owned by talent or even by our divisions and the leadership themselves. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that mobility has to do all this. You just need clarity inside of your company who's taking care of these topics. And some are better placed within the business unit as close to the to the hiring and placement decisions as possible. And, and uh, Francesca, this succession planning, does that work? Uh, because back to the first question we had, right, uh, as to how can we make sure that, that there are positions available for people coming back, would you say that that works pretty well uh, for most of people in uh, inside BISF? <laughs> Again, the higher up you are in a certain talent pool and on the radar of senior management, mm -hmm. the better it works, in oh. my personal opinion. Um, I can't say that it works equally well for all kinds of talents who have been on assignment, right? Because the strategic value of these talents is indeed a little bit different from time to time. Yeah. But definitely it works a lot better, I would say, than for the average um, BASF person because we do a lot to keep these people on the radar of the people who take the decisions and who do the reviews. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, um, so, one thing that I also wanted to emphasize is not only about tiny themselves. So, what you see in that blue box is here is some options and consultations that we are doing or will be doing for our business units very soon, which is more an overarching topic. So, something that we have implemented, for example, some years ago is a one way policy for internal candidates to um, bring some more life into our internal cross-border job market. Yeah, So if you have somebody from France applying for a job in uh, our headquarter in Ludwigshafen, we wanted to have a reliable deal for these people. It's not very fancy, but it's a basic level of support on which they can um, uh, rely when they put in the application. So this is also one way how mobility can actually support talent management and talent mobility on the ground for everybody. Um, we, ha we have another question, uh, yeah. Francisca, for you. And it reads like, where do you host the connection with Anchor or with the end of assignment tracker? Do you have a separate in-house system or is this combined and outsourced via the system environment of a relo provider? So we use our um, um, relocation management software, which is very common in the market. It's Assignment Pro. It's one of the big um, providers um, out there, but it's, um, it's our own system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you but also reload some reload providers have very good options for example and some companies are also handling a lot of this in their talent management systems or in their sap uh, hr environment for example mm -hmm. um one thing that i want to move to because i'm really excited about this is um when you talk about consulting the business um is mobility analytics because we are also working uh, on this and here I am talking a little bit more about the future than about the present or the past. Yeah, But I wanted to give you some examples because depending on where you come from and which background you have in HR, my experience is that numbers are not always our friends, but they have a lot of power for mobility. So what we have, is, have been starting now is actually offer consultation to our business units on their mo mobile po employee population, considering the fact that these people are very expensive and we have more and more complete information about them than for many, many other comp uh, employees. Yeah? Um, so one thing that we are monitoring together with our business units, for example, is here at the top, um, an overview of age groups that are on assignment and the cost. Uh, not to say, and of course, if you're from the US, for example, you might cringe and say, oh my God, I don't want any discrimination based on age. It's not because we want to have any candidate based decisions um, have on the, uh, have based on this data, but basically it shows you very quickly if you have a healthy distribution of your mobile talent in your unit. Yeah, And you can also see here, that moving somebody in their 30s cost about half as moving somebody um, uh, 
uh, between 40 and 45 years old. Yeah, so thinking of talent management, trying to always get the units and leadership to nominate people earlier, to take brave decisions about potential of people. It's actually a hands, a, a really um, hands on point for making these talent decisions. Yeah, even if they are uncertain decisions sometimes early in people's career and not wait until you're 100% sure that this person has the potential. Yeah, that's just one example. The other piece that we are working on with our business units, oh, I clicked on the wrong piece here, is actually um, to get closer to um, the return on investment of an, uh, of an assignment. So for us, and return on investment is actually an index of factors showing that an assignment is successful. So we count performance, we count attrition, we count the placement after return from the assignment, and we also look at the career development in the years that follow an assignment. And out of this, we can actually calculate how um, successful an assignment has been and relate it with the costs that have been caused by an assignment. Yeah. And you also have to differentiate, of course, by the purpose. Yeah, For people who are supposed to make a career leap, it makes a lot of sense to monitor the development. For people who are filling a knowledge gap, it makes a lot of sense to focus on their actual performance during that assignment. Yeah, So these are just some insights and in how we are also trying to bring value to our business units uh, on top of individual services and policies. And Wim, you mentioned technology. This is very close to my heart. Mm. Te technology enables this. Yeah. So we have 1,000 assignees, and thinking of all the data points that just go into these four charts, this is really big data. So we are using proper analytics software. Um, machine learning is in use, and also this really relies on a proper assignment management system, on proper HR IT systems, for example, local talent software which I'm aware is not in place everywhere, but as soon as you have this in place, there's really a wealth of insights you can get from these, um, from these mobility analytics. Yeah, I love it. It's, uh, I think it's fantastic. It's a really amazing, uh, amazing result. So in case we bored you um, a little bit with um, these nerdy analytics topics, we actually have a question to the audience now. So. This is a model I found in a Deloitte paper, I believe, um, about the evolution of the mobility function. Yeah, So you usually start with some compliance topics, then you focus on service quality. Later on, you try to meet business needs, and eventually, in a perfect marriage, you have a total synchrony of talent management or mobility. Um, for BSF, I would say we are somewhere in the third column, doing a little bit of the fourth. Also, within the last two years, to be honest, we're having a, little, a very big focus on service stability and service excellence as well. Yeah, we have definitely gotten over stage one by now, but this is where I would put ourselves. So now our question to you in the poll, and if we could open the poll now, you can give us your you can give us your estimate of where do you see your own organization in this um, yeah evolution model of mobility. Okay, so please submit your responses now. We see them coming in. Okay. Yeah, it looks like everybody has voted and... Not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now they have. Can, can we show the results? Yeah, so um, the, the biggest percentage is also in block three, like what you were saying, uh, Francisca, with the second, mm -hmm. so that's 45% of, of uh, our attendees are saying uh, they're meeting business objectives and needs. Uh, only uh, about 10% have really are in block four of global talent management. Uh, and, and a lot, 36% uh, are still in core service efficiency. And of course, that that uh, that supports what uh, the, the topic of today's webcast. And um, I guess that's also why we, we have so many people registering for this uh, for this webcast, which uh, which of course is fantastic. Um, okay, thank you for that. Let's uh, move on over back over to you, uh, Francisca. 
Yeah, so how do you get to that fourth column, actually? Mm -hmm. this, was, this was also piece of or part of the question today, right? Um, so some things that are happening in the market, just to give you some ideas, but it's definitely not a full list of things. And anything you do, of course, needs to fit with your own organization and your own organized needs. So in my opinion, kind of the next evolution step for our company and for many corporations would be to have a more democratized talent culture. Yeah? Um, some of you, I saw that somebody from Facebook, for example, um, registered for this event. I don't know if they are there. I might think, okay, what's the matter here? Yeah. Um, but self-nomination for talent pools, posting international assignment positions and having some kind of formal selection process is still for the big corporations I know um, a, a very big stretch because it also really means cultural change in how you approach your talent management and that you actually trust your people to self-select um, yeah, themselves or each other uh, for career paths and for assignment. Yeah? And as soon as you do that, um, you also have to be more open about people who are not mobile or maybe for a while not mobile, which is also a topic that is more and more interesting for us in BSF, for example. But still kind of an issue if you have a requirement for international experience for certain leadership levels, for example, which we have. Yeah, so it's a lot of food for thought. And coming back to the consultation and support we have for the mobile people, as soon as you open positions abroad for people who do these self-initiated moves, so the Erasmus people, yeah, it also means that you have to extend your consultation and monitoring and handholding capacities um, to these people. And um, you really have to think well if there's a return on investment in this additional um, in this additional effort actually but this in my opinion would be one of the uh, of the next steps another thing is a dream of mobility always been to get involved into candidate assessments one example is to measure cultural adaptability before an assignment identify certain risks or learning fields yeah and then give a recommend give a customized recommendations for coaching or training options for example yeah or maybe coming to one that we tried and it didn't work so well a couple of years ago we thought let's give the business some guidelines how to select their assignees based on our experience because we have a good idea about cultural adaptability about risk pro like how willing people are take uh, hard to taking a risk how much trouble is it going to cause for them in their assignment if they don't really want to go? Yeah. Um, so with all good intentions, we put together some kind of guideline and discussed this with our business units and our HR business partners in the divisions. And the response was, we don't need this. We can select our own people very well. We don't need your insights for this. Yeah? Um, so assignee selection is is a double-edged sword because it doesn't only depend on if you do it in a good way or not. It also depends on who is actually selecting the people. Uh, one learning for us. Yeah, and then just shortly coming back to the recruitment topic, of course, yeah, something that BSF is not getting into so much, maybe because we don't feel the pain yet, is of course attracting mobile talent groups also to hire them into the company and to sharpen your EVP with them. Yeah, these digital people uh, not wanting to relocate, but wanting to commute between different countries, for example. Um, talent swaps for people who are not mobile for two years, but can be mobile for six or eight weeks, for example, thinking of female talent with family commitment. Yeah? extended business trips, and then also speaking of, re of the realm of not even employees, but gig workers, people who support you for a certain time as a freelancer, for example, but never become part of your workforce. All these groups are very, very attractive talent groups to fill some needs that we um, might have in our companies in the future. And where mobility, in my opinion, can deliver a lot of expertise and a lot of um, options to also yeah, get these people interested in our companies and get them to stay. So with this, I hope I gave you some insights and a long uh, um, presentation already answered some of your questions. But I will hand over to Wim for more questions and also your comments and your 
your insights on the topic. Thank you so much, uh, Francisca. I've taken a lot of notes and, and uh, just to highlight, if I may highlight a few points that I uh, noted down. First of all, you could hear how I, uh, enthusiastic I was on this uh, ROI and uh, analytics thing. I think that's really fantastic uh, because that's where uh, I think we can also show that, you know, what uh, how HR can can be uh, a partner in uh, in making uh, good business decisions. Uh, the other uh, piece I loved was the the whole uh, succession planning and development plan uh, piece, where you are really forcing a line manager to write a development plan for an individual uh, with with the home country mentor or anchor. Uh, that that's really fantastic. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, what, what I call the reverse auction, and which you call the race to the bottom, uh, that we have to be uh, very careful. Of course, that um, you you, you yeah, people still want to go. Uh, because uh, inevitably uh, an international assignment will always be more expensive than a local. But um, so it, it's really important that that it is part really of that bigger uh, development plan. Because as I always say, the cheapest expat assignment is the one that doesn't happen. And so you only want you want to make sure that you only have those uh, assignments where it is really the uh, the only option uh, in terms of well, the only option or the preferred option in terms of uh, development for the employee. All right. Um, so thank you so much. Um, no further questions as far as I can see. Um, so I think uh, we can uh, close the uh, webcast. And but before we do so, um, I would like to uh, attract your attention to the fact that um, the conference board has a lot of material also. Uh, and the researchers of the conference board have uh, produced great insights about uh, global mobility and about talent uh, development. You can find that uh, on the conference board website. And please go there if uh, if that's what uh, what you're interested in. It's it's really very interesting. Um, and um, oh yes, there is one more question. Uh, that I guess that's to you, Francisca. Uh, it, would it be possible to? Um, uh, to see the calculations underneath the ROI on mobility? Um, well, nothing I can show you, but I can explain it maybe a little bit. So what we are doing very much hands on is um, to um, track the different topics that we saw. So we have a performance rating, which we track for all our assignees. We, um, we look at their placement after the return, and mm -hmm. we also look at the career development over time. How do we do this? Um, like most of you, we have a job grading system, so we can actually see if people advance through the job grades as one very reliable and calculatable indicator of career progression. Yeah, um, And we measure attrition, um, which mm -hmm. is a little bit more manual at the moment, but doable for our population and understand who leaves us in the two years after assignment. And all these topics we put into one index and relate it with the total cost that an assignment has had. And with this, you basically get a percentage yep. and can compare your own assignees versus another division. You can, you can compare female versus male talent and also look at the different destinations or origins of the people and see if there's any patterns. Yeah? Uh, and it's also one approach to actually understanding how much money, speaking of which policy you want to invest into um, an assignee, depending on, for example, the, the likeliness that this person is uh, maybe just going to be a regular performer or um, has certain likeliness of leaving your company. This is how we do it in a very tangible way, I hope. And uh, each each factor is weighed more or less equally? Yeah, at the moment, yes. And this is where we still have to collect some experience. Mm -hmm. We are making one difference. We are looking at a different weighting and also slightly different factors for, let's say, still, uh, filling skills gaps or knowledge gaps. Right. And um, uh, people in, in, in certain pipelines or talent pools because, yeah. At the one hand, you have to look more at the performance. On the other thing, you have to really look at the future development, the assignment um, causes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you uh, very much, Francisca. Was, uh, and thank you for a, a great question also. So um, before you go, please uh, tell us about your experience and give us some uh, feedback. This is also helpful for, well, of course, for future um, 
uh, for future webcasts, but also for ourselves to see how we've been doing. Uh, and of course, there are uh, a number of uh, councils that you can join. You see them here, the Total Rewards Council, the Talent Council, uh, the Benefits Council. Uh, so if you're interested in these councils, please go to the website in the conference board and you can get uh, registered uh, there through your company. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for attending today's webcast and hope to hear and see you again. Thanks a lot, Francisca, for uh, your uh, beautiful expose and uh, all the best.